This is Alex Del Sordo at a Rower's Choice First. I have Olympians with me. I have undefeated rowers from college. And I got an insurance salesman with me. And this is the first ever coaches yelling. If you've ever seen anything like around the horn, this is the same concept, but for rowing. And you're gonna, we're gonna be talking about major topics in the sport of rowing that will uh, get pe people passionate and excited. And at the end of this, we're gonna crown a winner. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through two questions. Each person in this, in this series here has two minutes or a minute and a half to answer. If I like what they're saying, you're gonna see a thumbs up. Uh, unfortunately, Zoom hasn't figured out a down, a thumbs down yet. But once they are done, they're done, they're muted, and then we're gonna move on to the next person. Person whose points, um, unfortunately, doesn't make it to the next round. At the end, we will have two people pitted up against each other, answering questions and talking about topics that are near and dear to every coach's heart here in the rowing world. So welcome to the first ever episode of Coaches Yelling. And I'm going to introduce my first person, uh, Carrie Simmons, and uh, two-time world champion, no one else can say that here, and a 2016 women's Olympic champion in the eight. She is the actually the most decorated athlete in this batch of people here. Carrie, welcome to the show. Thank you. And I also want to highlight that I still hold the world record in the women's oh, eight. Okay. So but I'm happy to be here and I hope you all are staying safe, those that are watching. And um, it's fun to uh, talk rowing again. This is great. So uh, next is a... Uh, <laughs> is a St. Joe's prep legend. Uh, he is the program director of Chicago Rowing Foundation, a father of two. I thought that he wasn't gonna wear a shirt with sleeves, but he went with sleeves this time. He is a Cal Bear rower. This is Mike Wallen. Mike, welcome to the show, man. Uh, yeah, I'd also like to point something out. These are, these are half sleeves. I wouldn't say that they're full sleeves. So just, you know, being a little bit professional for the show, but also. No, don't want to go full sleeve. It's a it's a schmedium. It looks like a schmedium. It's perfect for you. Uh, uh, thank you and welcome to the show. The next guy I have, the other Olympic athlete, the Olympic athlete that did not win a gold medal, uh, but he has never lost a race on American soil in college. Only a few people in the world that can say that. He is the founder of Rower Academy. He's an, also a Cal Cal Bear, the former ED of the my favorite race, the Crew Classic. Luke Walton, welcome to the show, man. Alex, thanks for having me. Uh, I do not have any distinction like Kerry does as an Olympic gold medalist, nor do I have uh, any world records. Uh, but I do hold the dubious distinction of flipping an eight my novice year in Mission Bay. So I'd like to like to add that to the discussion. I love that. Uh, you know, that's fuel. That's fuel. That's fire, man. For, for fighting fuel. words. I like that. Now, last last but not least. Uh, this is a friend of mine. I, we go back long ago. This is OCBP Hall of Famer, okay? Uh, he's lost a lot in college, unfortunately. Uh, father of three, and he is the best insurance salesman in the business, a coach to rowing, a current rower, and he kicked my ass in the Erg Mania Challenge. Zach Everson, welcome to the show, man. Oh, it's great to be here, and I'd also like to point out I've never lost on American soil either. Because the last time I checked, we don't row on soil. <laughs> oh, nice. Undefeated. So, <laughs> so what a way to, now the intros are done. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm really excited about this. We have a big collection of people from, from insurance salesmen to Olympians and guys running programs. I think this is going to go really well. This first question, Zach, we're going to start with you. So, uh, moderator, can we please mute everybody else right now? But, Zach, Zach, the first question goes to you. You have two minutes, and the clock starts when I am done reading the question. Okay. What if the standard racing distance of 2,000 meters was replaced with another distance? Now, I'm, now let, me, let me clarify. This could be 500 meters, 750, 1,000. It, my assumption here is that it's not more than 2,000. So go for it. Two right. minutes. If we're looking to bring the 2K down to, let's say, 1,500, and let me make this one point very clear. The people that are probably making this discussion in the most literal sense are losers. Because if you're winning at 2K, you don't want to change a thing. 
Um, if you want to lower things, if you want to make things more uh, competitive, that's because you're losing. So maybe that's coming off as sour grapes. Um, and it's funny that I just talked to um, the gentleman at Holy Cross. He's in Washington. And he kind of alluded to the fact we all know Yale's going to win um, over the course of 2K. But if it was 1,000, you never know. You come out of the gate too slow. You have a bad start. You catch a crab. There's not a lot of time to recover from that. Um, there's no perfect distance. 2K, why isn't it? exactly a mile and a half why isn't it just a mile um but no test is perfect um but i would say this too if we brought it down from 2k to 1.5 it would be a butterfly effect throughout the entire rowing community the way we train the type of recruit and just demolish the lightweight program because the one thing that lightweights have is yeah i'm almost as fast as a heavyweight but i weigh 40 50 pounds less if you bring it down to a 1500 meter piece or a thousand they they can't hang they can't hang they don't have the power um do i want to see it shortened is 2k the best that's not my call um but i will say this if you're you know screaming from the rooftops to bring it down from a 2k to 1500 it's probably because you're losing Mm. So you have you have ten more seconds, uh, or do you want to forfeit the last ten seconds? Um, I just want to say, uh, stay safe, everyone. And um, Alex, how you doing after I kicked your butt in that? It hurt me really bad. Thank <laughs> you for for bringing that up. So you know, great points there. Uh, I walked away. With, I'm giving you a five. I'm giving you a score five. I don't know what this means yet. Out of what? But, uh, well, out of nothing. I mean, we're just going to add them up at the end here. I like some of the topics you brought up, especially you're changing the culture of rowing, right? You're changing the type of athlete. So next on the docket, same question. This is Luke Walton. Luke Walton is up. We're going to unmute him. Um, now, again, I'm going to repeat the question. What if the standard racing distance of 2000 was replaced with something else? You are on the clock. Go. All right, so uh, I'm going to be half loser on this, half loser, because the athlete in me uh, 100% agrees, let's keep 2K. Uh, and, and the reason to keep 2,000 meters is that it's a standard. Uh, it's a standard that we all understand. It's a standard that we all race under, and we can compare to the best of our ability that standard, uh, specifically that standard on a rowing machine, right? 2,000 meters on a rowing machine. So, um, but... The race director in me and the spectator in me, um, I'm, not, I'm not wed to a 2K. I want to see more close finishes. I want to see more excitement. I want athletes to be able to race more often. Um, and the 2K distance wasn't always a thing. So late 1800s in France, we settled on 2,000 meters, and that was sort of the, uh, the introduction of 2K. Uh, colleges started to adopt 2K in Olympic years because they wanted to train their athletes so that they could go race at the Olympics. We reinforced it at Crash B's with 2,000 meters, 2,000 meters. But even Crash B's started as a 2,500 meter race. Uh, the boat race has changed, uh, Cambridge Oxford boat race changed distance three different times, I think, in the, in the length of its uh, racing campaign. Um, so I'm torn. As an athlete, I want those 2K standards to be judged by. I got that, that purity in me. But as a race director and a spectator, I want to cut down those distances, even down to 1,000 meters or less. Uh, the shorter distance, you get more bodies of water to race on. There's more places that we can host racing. Um, but I do agree, it's going to change the training. It's going to change the type of athlete. Uh, it's going to change uh, rowing in general, just in, in terms of who's going to do well. Uh, to speak to the lightweight issue, uh, lightweight rowing has been on the chopping block forever. And if we're going to survive as an Olympic sport, that's we're time. seeing. That's time. I got to ah. cut you off two minutes. But look, there were a lot of really great points that you made here, and I was very impressed with your history. You know, I, I, you went right out the gate with the history. That's beautiful. Um, and you know what? I did not know that the boat race was changed three different times. That, that brings up a really good point that I think that we've hit a point in rowing that we are ready for that change. So far, I am convinced so far with the two comments that we're ready for a change in distance. Now, let's move on to Mike Wallen. Now, this guy, Mike, uh, I don't know. Well, he's I don't know about Luke racing the high school scholastic world, but, you know, he raced the 1500. So, Mike, 
Question for you again, let me repeat it. What if the standard racing distance of 2,000 meters was replaced with another distance? You are on the clock, go. Um, you know, I'm speaking from a guy who's done a lot of winning. Um, I don't think it's a, uh, you know, a loser's mentality to want to uh, look at other distances. I think it's something we should strongly consider uh, at least domestically for, for novice juniors. Um, I think we, you know, there's this agenda that we got to get high school kids in small boats. We got to do singles and pairs, and that's the way we're going to beat Great Britain and uh, Australia at the higher levels. And I just think we're playing at that point, we're playing their game, right? They're, the sports are, the sport's gotten pretty big here, but it's, it's nowhere near as popular here as it is there. And by popular, I mean the top athletes in those countries, you know, rowing is a sport they consider from a young age. We don't quite have that here yet. We have a lot of good athletes, but the strength in our country, the strength for us to go further is our popular. You know, we want to make sport more inviting to people right when they start. And when you're talking about a kid who's 14, 15 years old, they might be able to roll off a basketball court or a soccer field or a volleyball court and instantly be, you know, a stud nationally at 500 meters. And to me, you know, looking at the long term, that's somebody I want to bring to the sport more than like, you know, some kid who's just been rowing since sixth grade with their dad and now they've got a head start on everyone. So they become the studs right away. I mean, if you look at the novice eights across the country, I'm sure my, my experience personally, my experience as a coach now. You know, making the novice a boat for the 2K distance is not an indicator at all of how your career is going to go, even next year as a sophomore in the varsity. Um, so I think we got to we got to think about that. You know, we want to be collecting the most raw athletes we can, the most physical, impressive specimens we can. And if initially that's you know 500 meter race, like that's great. You know, maybe that kid grows five inches the next year, and now he's ready for 2K. Maybe he gets more serious about his fitness. And now he's ready for 2K. But the current the current setup is that kid, because they're not 2K ready freshman year, they get put in the novice C or D or whatever. Back to this. I just want to play basketball. Time. Need- Time. Nice job. I like that. He was going on a rant there, and I, and I, and I wanted to keep going, but we got to keep up with the time. Kerry. You are it for the end uh, of the first question. Let me repeat this one more time before I start the clock. What if the standard racing distance of 2,000 meters was replaced with another distance? You are on the clock. Well, I'm confident in saying that if I had raced shorter than a 2K distance as an elite athlete, I would not have been as successful. I come from more of an endurance background, and I think the 2K distance kind of marries the power endurance best. I think it highlights underdogs at times, which we all, I think, love about the sport because it requires, you can't just muscle through a 2K, not rowing wise. Like you just, you have to have fitness, you have to have efficiency and you have to work together. And I think if we were to shorten it to a thousand say, I think you're gonna lose that. You're just gonna start seeing more of the athletes that are just, you know, as Mike was saying, physically, the best specimens. And I think that loses what we all love about rowing, which is, you know, I'm going to bring an example, the French pair in that 2000 race, they made that push. I I believe it was around the 1500, maybe a little bit before we love that race. I was a part of the women's eight in the world cup two in 2014. We pushed through Canada in the last 600, we had raced pairs race before we were tapped. And I think if that had been any shorter than 2K, we would not have won. So I think that mental toughness, that grit, which we love about rowing, that makes it one of, if not the hardest sport, I I think it probably is the hardest sport I've ever competed in, at least. If we shorten it too much, we lose that. So I'm hesitant as someone that did well in the elite level, I would be open to, you know, adding events, not subtracting necessarily events, keeping the 2K, especially for championship events. But, you know, as Luke said, like add more racing, do sprints, you know, Long Beach for juniors and masters is I think around 1500. Why can't we do more bodies of water? and Time, 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 not bad. Well, let's do a recap of the scores. Uh, Carrie, six points. Luke and Mike tied at seven and Zach at five. That's it. That's where I'm at right now. Carrie came in strong with the point of marrying endurance and strength. I love that. Uh, It's obvious that she doesn't want to see it changed. And uh, Zach, you know, 
you probably got the fewest points because you were first, all right? Like I just, you were first. But now we're gonna go back around the horn here and we're gonna start with Carrie on the next question. Okay, now you have 90 seconds to answer this. Now let's, let's unmute it and uh, here's the question, Carrie. Is long distance training, specifically four by 20, three by 20, for high school athletes hurting the future of our sport? You are on the clock, 90 seconds. I love this question. This is why I was motivated to go for therapy. Um, I do believe that the volume of training that we're seeing at the high school level is contributing to chronic injuries that they, you know, maybe go a year in college and then they're out. So we're seeing more athletes getting injured quicker. Um, and I think that it's not necessarily, can we pinpoint it to long distance training? I think we can pinpoint it to just overall volume is too much, not taking advantage of cross training, which can be effective. And athletes not knowing how to, either not knowing that they have the resources to prevent this, not feeling like they can speak up or just it's getting ignored so these chronic injuries toughing it out it's kind of an old school mentality with rowing how can coaches and athletes just be better informed about preventing injuries would be more of what i would like to see incorporated long distance training can be done well i've seen high school athletes do it well is it right for every athlete no so mm -hmm. i can't answer that definitively i feel like I think people need to build up to it better. And I think there needs to be more time dedicated to injury prevention and learning how to row better so that they're not using. All right. so let me, let me, let me, I want to clarify something. I want to find your position on this, on this topic. So your answer is yes, it is hurting the future of our sport. Long distance, hard training like that is hurting the future of our sport. Is that a, is that a fair assessment for you? Um, yes, when done improperly. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, you're going to end the round of one with nine points. That's your total right now. So for Luke and Mike to get past that, you guys need at least three uh, points. And Zach, you are you got You got You got to double up your score here, bud. So <laughs> the next, um, I think it goes to uh, Mike. So. Mike, you are on the clock. Let me add, let me let me rephrase this question let me, one more time. Right? Is long distance training, four by twenty minutes, for high school athletes hurting the future of our sport? You are on the clock. Um, yeah, it is, uh, no doubt about it. Um, I think you know to to Carrie's point, like if it's done perfectly, it can be effective. I think the odds of it being done perfectly are are pretty slim, and I I just don't think the the gains you're going for are worth the risk of the negative possibilities, the burnout, the injury. Um, and plus, it's, it's just irresponsible, right? Um, it, it, it becomes a, a culture about the coach and produ producing r results right now with his crew or her crew instead of let's make these kids fast for the 2K and let's get them ready for college. Let's keep them fresh, you know. And look, like a sweeping thing across a room of high school random athletes who come to your program, that's different than a bunch of D1 athletes you recruited that might be ready for that type of workload. Four by 20 minutes is not going to fly for any high school or room across the room. There's going to be many kids in there who can't handle it, if not the majority. So I think that's a really bad idea. Like, I think you're putting kids at risk. They get to college, they're burned out. Some kids on my team, you know, want to do extra work. They go do extra work. Some kids are sick. They're tired. They need some free time. They don't do it. That's a double bonus for me and my crew. The kids who want extra work are choosing to do it. The kids who need time to recover are choosing to take the time to recover. That's helping every athlete on my team be prepared to be faster the next day of practice or the next race. And it's making them ready and excited about the sport. They're not burned down. They're not hurt. They're excited for the next level. And they go into it knowing, hey, there's going to be an uptick in training and uptick in volume. I'm, in, I'm at a college level now. That's going to be a bigger that's load. Fine. I think that's fine. Fine. You know, there is there is a really good uh, point there. We're going to get into it later in a diff in, in other topics. But uh, Mike, you ended the round uh, with 12 total. So. Uh, Carrie, you're on the chopping block right now at nine. Uh, and let's see if the rambling Luke can uh, redeem himself and try to get a couple points. Luke, let me, uh, let me repeat the question again. Here we go. Is long distance training, four by 20, for high school athletes hurting the future of our sport? You are on the clock. Yes. Next question. 
<laughs> no, but in all, in, in all seriousness, yes. And to, and to, to Carrie's point, one of the things that I really like about what she said is, is that, um, and I think this is kind of the answer to both questions, is the old school mentality of rowing. I think tradition in rowing is the double-edged sword, right? There are so many things that are great about rowing tradition that we really want to keep, but we're afraid to venture into new and different because of rowing tradition. Um, and I think things like long, steady state pieces and four by 20 are one of those things. Um, and they've been employed for a very long time and high school coaches are thinking they'll get more of their athletes uh, out of their athletes and doing that. And I just, I don't agree. I'm with Mike. Um, if, if we're going to keep people engaged and if the mission is the future of the sport and building youth up into uh, Olympic level contention, you're not doing that at four by 20 when you're, when you're young. And uh, I think we've talked before, all of us have talked before about junior national team burnout. Guys and girls on the junior national, how many of them actually want to represent the United in the Olympic Games? And so I, I'm with Mike and, and I'm with Carrie. That's very difficult to do. Uh, we should be engaging youth. We should be getting them excited. We should be getting them rowing well. And that's repeating smaller, shorter distances so that that technique is of a higher level and not being compromised in these long 80 minutes of That's just time. steady state. That's time. Well, you edged her out. You got 11 there. So Mike, number one at 12. Now it's at Zach. Zach, you have 90 seconds to redeem yourself and you got to score at least five points to take down the Olympic champion, Carrie. So let me repeat the question again. Okay. You have 90 seconds when I'm done asking this question. Is long distance training? For high school athletes hurting the future of our sport, you are on the clock. All right, so I'm, my back's on the mat right now. It would be easy for me to say yes because everyone else said yes. I'm going to say no. Or from the insurance guy, I'm going to say I need, I need more information. All right? Yeah. I will say this. I will say this. Um, do I think long-distance training is bad for everyone? No. But if you roll in as a freshman or if a sophomore is automatically an upperclassman and now a sophomore and a junior is, all right, you're doing this blanket workout. Yes, it's going to be really bad for that individual. And that four by 20, is that on an ongoing basis? Is that like, hey, every Tuesday, Thursday, we're going to do four by 20? Yes, I think that's too much. But the, if you're a senior, and it depends on the program, and it depends on literally the boat, the personnel that you have. If you have a boat that wants to win youth nationals or wants to win Stotesbury and the numbers add up where your boat average 2K is like 620, yeah, we might need to do this work. But I'm not going to look to the other rest of the kids and say, all right, we're all going to do three by 30 minutes. We're all going to do four by 20. That, I will say, is ineffective. Um, but you can't argue that long and low every once in a while, and if that – four by 20 is your, the hardest, longest day. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. Maybe you scale it back and you do three by 15 minutes or you do an hour of power where. Uh, oh, see, he's now, see, now he can't. <laughs> nope, nope. So listen, I, his, his, his ability to say, not every program is, is cut and dry. He got that last point. He got 10 points. Kerry, I'm sorry to say you ended with nine. Zach edged it out there. Um, so, <laughs> so she is going to stay muted, okay? So for everyone watching, she's going to stay muted because in the end, I do want her to say one last thing here. Now, we are going to take a short 15-second uh, break here for a word from our sponsors uh, at Resolute Racing Shells. We're back, uh, and Carrie is out, so let's mute her. She's done for this moving forward. Now, uh, the points are gonna keep going, okay? So Zach, you're in third uh, with with 10, Luke in second with uh, 11, and Mike in the lead with 12, so really tight. But this is a little bit different now. So you are now, as a group, gonna have a chance to sort of rebuttal, argue with one another about how you answer the original first three questions, okay? Now I'm gonna hit the clock, it's gonna be four minutes in length. 
it's going to be up to you guys who talks and, and, and who doesn't. Uh, if I don't like what I'm hearing, I'm going to cut you off and you're going to get a 10 second delay in your mute. And uh, from there, I'm going to add up the scores. And in the end, the top two guys will move on uh, with, uh, with the final round called the showdown. So uh, the clock starts now, guys, you are on the clock. Go for it. Let's see what you got. All right. Well, let me let me j jump in with a solution. How about that? Like okay, a solution. Go. We we got the two questions. I think they're tied together. Uh, l let's offer a solution. I think, at the very least, let's change the distance at the youth level. Let's experiment here. Let's get away from the two K. Change that distance beyond fifteen hundred, even shorter, faster yeah. races. I agree. Do it in the fall season. Do it in the fall you season. Do, okay, well, well, Luke, you're mute of 10 seconds. Go ahead, Wally. Give I me. agree. Look, I, I'm not saying I want to be at the Olympics and just watch, you know, a bunch of dudes who ate like 10 pizzas before the race to a 500. I'm saying like in high school, um, you know, I want to get as many different kinds of athletes into the sport as possible. I don't, I just, I think at that point, like we're, we don't know what they're going to be in four years, eight years, 12 years. They could be short, grow into themselves. They could take fitness more seriously. Like we just want different studs in the sport girls and, and guys side Changing um, isn't going to do that unless we get a like, cool equipment like a cool yes, in jerseys that's not going to do it change it to a 500 and 750 you know Look, every regatta sucks they're all boring with this guy did a 2k then this guy did a 2k then this guy did a 2k with two wars then this guy did a 2k with eight cut off 10 seconds mute him go ahead zach finish your topic yeah we can change the distances we can do everything there Rowing is a specific type of person, a specific inside type of person. You're, we're not going to be able to compete with the uh, lacrosse kids, you know, the kids with the flow. We're not going to say, <laughs> we're not going to say, hey, guess what? It's too hard a 2K, but guess what? You can row a 1,000. They're going to say, yeah, I still don't know how to do it. It's what still you, not dude, that's what the whole sport is. It's people metal chasing in small boats. He's unmuted and already? All this other stuff. <laughs> Like, it's, a, it's lame. There's like a 3V, a 4V, a 5V. Like, let's see somebody do something different. But, but holistically, for the sport, we're on the chopping block at the Olympics all the time. We're always losing ground in the Olympics. We're cutting lightweight events. There's heavyweight events being cut. When do we lose completely, and what adaptations are we going to make to remain an Olympic sport? Which is, there's no professional rowing. So unless, I mean, we could probably start a professional rowing league. That's the next step. But right now, it's just the Olympics. So what are we going to do? How are we going to maintain our foothold on the Olympics if we're losing viewership and we're losing size of uh, who's the best, who's the best rower in the world? I think we're doing it right now. This is how we get the ball rolling is by trash talking is by making these videos. Alex, you're doing a great job doing what you're doing. If oh, he's just, kissing up. He's kissing up. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, who's the best rower in the world? Nobody even knows. Like they don't even race each other at the Olympics. It's, it's so like confusing. Like, can we, I would rather see someone win the 500 than like just be like, well, like I go to a race from high school, college, and now as a coach, I can't explain to anyone who really won. Well, that's the same with track. Different. That's the same huh? with track or swimming. No, it's not. In track, everyone watches the 100 meter dash. He wins the 100 meter dash. Everybody knows there's a different athlete winning that race than the guy winning the mile. If if you Usain Bolt and whoever won the mile walked into a store together, you wouldn't know that they played the same sport. They look totally different. They do it different. Every rower, whether you're in the single or stroke in an eight, you're doing the exact same thing. You're the exact same athlete. Like, that, we're splitting hairs within our own community if we're disputing that. Like, someone on the stands can't, can't tell the difference. It's the same guy. It's the same job. It's just like, I'm holding two rows in a one-man. Yeah, go ahead. Give it to me. Right. I would say, so what? Just make it an eight. Doubles, quads, singles, lightweight. Just axe everything. Then you have the eight, and that is it. And whoever's fastest, that's the best. Or – Flip it the other way, singles. Whoever's the fastest single. Luke, uh, Luke you, got, you got 10 seconds. You and Zach are tied. You got, you got the last word here. Can you, can you pull out a victory? You have 10 seconds. Come on. Give we got to get away from tradition. We got to market ourselves better. The few of the sport depends on evolving into new and different. We got to get outside of this 2K mentality. All right. So, mute them. All right. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pickle here, guys. I got a dead tie between Luke and Zach, all right? I got, here's the thing. I don't want to hear anything that you've already said, okay? So you got, you each have 15 seconds to give me the best argument on changing the distance, okay? 
I'm going to go Luke first. Luke, unmute. You got 15 seconds. Go. Well, I haven't talked about the the just health of an athlete. Let's like Mike said. Let's let's be true to our youth athletes. Build them up. There's plenty of time when you become an Olympian to row three times a day and get in all those extra Done. miles. 15 seconds. All right. So his play is 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 a health. Now, Carrie, this is going to come down to you. You're going to tell me who the winner is based on Zach's answer right now. Okay. So we're going to keep you involved, all right? Zach, you got 15 seconds to do a better argument for Kerry. Ready? Go. All right. First off, Luke Wallen's a basketball coach. He knows nothing about rowing. All right. <laughs> Second off, um, he's been talking already. He's been bringing up the same points. The 2K is the 2K, and it's already 1,500 at the youth level unless you go to the youth nationals. It's already 1,500. Stop. Kerry. Let me carry for a minute. I want to know, who do you think made the best argument between Zach and Luke this past round? I mean, I liked the joke, Zach, but you didn't really make much of an argument. <laughs> so in that, if I'm judging argument's sake, Luke would have gotten you there. All right, there it is. All right. Um, now, this has been amazing. We are moving into the showdown between Luke Walton and Mike Wallen. Ironically, they rode for the same program at the same time. Now they're pitted against each other. And this is going to happen after word from our sponsor. So uh, the next sponsor, I believe, is Sykes Racing out of Australia. We are back now to the to the showdown. This is the exciting part. This is where I bring in new questions that these guys uh, have uh, the contestants have not been made aware of, and 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 we're pitting against two Cal Bears. We're getting a guy that's never lost uh, on American waters. How's that? I fi I fixed that. And Mike Wallen, uh, who's lost a little bit, but uh, is running arguably the fastest high school program in the country with Chicago Rowing Foundation. Uh, so, Luke, this goes to you. We're going to start the clock after I'm done reading this question. You have 45 seconds to a minute here. What should the U.S. national team do to win in the small boat and sculling events? Go. Uh, I see where you're going with this. So, uh, you know, we see, we've all seen the U.S. rowing article about small boats, and that's kind of the flavor of the month right now. we got a lot of youth athletes and asking questions about should I do small boats or should I go to this camp and, and all this stuff. Um, here's my personal take. I learned to row a small boat in college. I learned how to row. I learned how to row hard in high school, but I learned how to refine that skill and row a small boat in college. I think college coaches should pay more attention to breaking their teams down into small boats, even if they don't race them. Is that, are you done with your argument? What we need. Okay. It was clean. Clean, 36 clean. seconds. Mike, we're going to open this up to you. Now I'm going to repeat this question so you are aware. What should the U.S. national team do to win in the small boat or sculling events at the national level or, the, or rather the Olympic or world championship level? You're on the clock, Mike. I think it's, it's just going to come down to making the elite athlete pool bigger. Um, you know, your, your coach, I mean, we have great coaches. I think they protect your floor. I think your ceiling, your upside comes from the depth of talent. So we got to get – a way to get more people in sport that are significantly gifted with that combination of uh, power and endurance like Kerry was talking about. The deeper that pool gets, the more likely we are to have faster boats in, in all the disciplines, eight, four, pair. Um, and again, I think that comes into changing some stuff, like making the sport a little bit more spectator friendly so people look at it and say, man, that's something I want to do. Maybe I'll do that after basketball season. Maybe I'll give up basketball to be a good rower when, once I realize I'm not going to Duke. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean every basketball player is great. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean that has to start in high school. I mean, look at the list of Olympians who started rowing in college, didn't even row in high school. You know, Jake Wetzel, Lindsey Shoup, uh, you know, Volpe. I mean, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a short list. Um, so, you know, you get somebody that elite. Mute them. All right. So then I think what I heard was Luke says get – rowing on the smaller boats at the college level, get college coaches more focused on smaller boat training and competing. Mike says, just get a bigger pool of athletes. Let's just find a way to get more athletes into the sport of rowing, which will ultimately get more people in boats 
and just spread that out. There was no talk about specific levels. He didn't mention that. He just really focused on getting more athletes here into rowing. Okay, I'm gonna go back with Mike now. So um, we're not keeping score. For this round, Zach and I are gonna help decide who the winner is, okay? So an, a bystander is gonna help us to decide the winner here. I'm gonna open this up with Mike. Mike, the question is, should the U.S. adopt a British style training? So what that means is athletes day one start rowing in small boats, sculling, either in cox quads, pair uh, doubles. They do not allow athletes to row sweep until they are prepared and ready. Should the U.S. adopt that same style of training? You've got a minute. Go ahead. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I don't think it should be mandatory either. I think that's very limiting. Um, I think that makes a lot less uh, programs able to – do it that specific way. And if you can't race and you can't compete, you know, kids aren't going to stay engaged and, and want to stay with it. Um, I, I, I'm not trying to dump on small boats. I mean, everybody feels the difference between being in an eight and a pair, especially the first couple of times you're in it, like you develop an awareness, some nuances with what your personal impact is in the boat. And that's definitely important. And you can get lost in an eight. There's no doubt. Um, but I, I think the answer is just picking an event that we're considering the primary event. I think if we have that going on, coaches will get behind it. That can be the four, that can be the eight, that can be the quad. I don't really care. Just tell me what it is, and I'll start preparing athletes to, to win in that discipline. And then if the, if the eight is the second eight or the second boat and the, and, the, and the pair is the third boat, whatever we want to do, I think some uniformity across the board of, hey, this is the actual national champion because they won the straight four or they won the eight or they won the quad, whatever that is. I liked where he was going there. Now, Luke, this is your shot. You got one minute. I'm going to, I'm going to repeat the question, okay? Should the U.S. adopt a British style of training where you have the athletes at a young age start sculling, cox quads, doubles, and then once they're ready and prepared, moving into sweep competition? You're on the clock. Well, to be controversial, we all left Britain to come to the United States to find better, <laughs> right? So, so why would we replicate something that, that isn't better? Now, all joking aside, um, it's a practicality issue and it's a logistical issue. Unless you're going to have more shells and access to more equipment and you're going to have more coaches that can coach all of these individual shells, I don't know how you practically do that. And there are a lot of programs in the United States that have 30, 50, 100 athletes. How do you herd cats out there on tidal bodies of water, on uh, rivers? Uh, in other places. So, so I think it's, it's also an issue of practicality. So in the bigger boats, you can teach the skills, the general skills necessary to row, and then you can refine them in smaller boats. Uh, I, think, I think going from bigger to smaller is actually the right transition as opposed to smaller up to bigger. Uh, wow. What a way to close that argument. Um, this is a toss up, you know, Mike, Mike finished the round with the most points, scoring 17 compared to Luke's 14. So he had a three-point lead coming into this. Zach, I'm going to bring you back into the show here. Um, you know, let's, let, let's discuss how well these two guys did here. How do you, uh, how do you score this? Oh, man, I mean, it's tight. It's tight. Um, I don't know. Mike gets um, deducted a point because his picture's not even in frame. Half his head's cut off. <laughs> He's already at a deficit for there. Uh, and then Luke, he came out stuttering Stanley on the first one, uh, and they had left 10 seconds on the board, so he gets the duck at a point. I don't know. I mean, there was flashes of greatness and mediocrity all at the same time. So you're, you're, you're undecided. Kerry, let's bring Kerry back in here. Kerry, the Olympic champion, two-time world champion, and record holder, um, you know, you've been at all levels. Tell me, how do you think these two guys did here in that showdown? Well, I agree with a lot of what they were both were saying. Um, something that I think the theme is, is big picture thinking, making sure that the athletes aren't getting burnt out too early, getting the skill sets that they need, it, they need to be set up to succeed in college. I mean, I was a walk-on athlete. I basically did running and basketball in high school. And so I'm all about bringing more athletes, a bigger pool into the sport. So in that, in that regard, I think I agree with Mike. Okay, so if you had, if you had to, to, but between the two of you, right, Zach and, and Carrie, who would you say was the winner of that, of that round there? I think Luke stuck the landing on his second argument, so I would give the point to Luke. Okay, Carrie? 
I think Luke just backed up Mike's original argument. So I think Mike <laughs> mentioned it. Luke was inspired. All that practicality of equipment. I think Mike actually was the the first kind of he that was his idea. He maybe it didn't was. elaborate it. It was so much as Luke, but <laughs> I gotta give points to Mike. I was inspired by that argument. So well, which one more inspiring, Mike? Mike, Mike. You are the winner of the first ever Coaches Yelling episode number one and a very close second, Luke Walton. I mean, I got to say, it really ended strong. Luke's argument uh, at the end there, practicality, really hit home, you know. And, and, and I know that because of the, of the manufacturing side. It is very challenging to build all those boats because the, Britain and all, their other, all the other countries have been doing it for decades. We, in the 1980s and 1990s, decided that we're an AIDS program, and we stuck to it. And that's, that's what all the programs around the country have, uh, have done. So, Mike, amazing. Uh, when we get back here, uh, after a word from our sponsors of Rower Academy, Mike is going to give us a 30-second uh, shout-out to his amazing awesomeness of winning the first round. More from <laughs> Hey guys, it's Luke from Rower Academy, where we give you the information, tools, and training you need to successfully navigate the college recruiting process. Check us out at roweracademy.com and start training for your future today. All right, so we're back uh, with the Rower's Choice Coaches Yelling episode, and we have a winner, Mike Wallen, the program director of Chicago Rowing Foundation, winning the first ever Coaches Yelling. Mike, uh, you have what we call FaceTime. You got 30 seconds to just talk about how awesome you were at winning this competition. Well, I'll say this. I, uh, I lost my seat in the varsity to Luke in 2001, and then I lost the uh, Cox Four trials in 2002 to go to Worlds to Luke. So to uh, come back and get a W against him today felt pretty good. Um, he's undefeated in college rowing, uh, but I am currently undefeated in whatever we just did. So I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> that is awesome. So we're going to do, I mean, that perfect words. Uh, we're going to go around Robin. Last, last 10, 15 seconds to talk. Uh, Luke, as second place, go ahead, man. You got 15 seconds on the stage. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, Mike won, and he did make some concessions about what happened to rowing back in the day, but uh, I came up short today, and, and that stings. It really stings. I'm a competitor through and through, so to lose to Mike, I, I just want another chance. Tell us what the next topics are for the next show. I'm preparing now. Uh, Mike, I'm coming for you, man. I am coming for you. It's been, it's been dropped. I love it. I love the competitiveness of athletes. Carrie, uh, actually, no, Zach, you third place. Zach, let's hear it from you. Last 15 seconds. How are you feeling? Bronze, dirty gold. I love it. Um, I had a lot of fun. Um, this is what the sport needs. You know, everyone loves speed, but they love storylines. They love the trash talk, the underbelly of the rolling community. And this is what it was all about. Man, thank you so much. Kerry, to close out the round, uh, fourth place finish out of four, probably the worst performance in rowing you've ever had. But Kerry, tell me, how you feeling? Yeah, no, I think that the rowing community loves August. So I'll be ready. I was out of training with the rowing talk for a little bit, but if it happens again for me, I'll, um, I'll be more prepared. Awesome. Good job. Okay, well, this was, uh, this was a, a lot of fun, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Coaches Yelling. Now, we're launching this thing on our YouTube channel, at Rower's Choice, and we're also doing it on Instagram. Now, as you listen and you get engaged here, if you have topics that you want to hear about or if you have coaches that you think just absolutely have to be on this platform, please comment below in, and also uh, tag us on uh, Instagram at rowers underscore choice. Thank you for tuning in to the first episode. Congratulations to Mike Wallen winning uh, the first place finish here. And Carrie, again, the worst finish you've ever had in rowing. That's not a bad problem to have, but uh, thanks for watching, everybody. More from us uh, next week. Thank you.